Good afternoon, and thank you for joining Rittenhouse for an open online course. Today, our topic is global and domestic trends in public health. Um, this is a joint webinar with APHA Press, Duty Enterprises, and Rittenhouse. So we're um, excited to have um, this opportunity to bring together a panel of experts, really, um, in this topic. And um, we're going to go through and introduce our panel in just a moment. Um, this, pan this discussion today is going to provide an overview of um, public health, some trends from a high level. We'll have a lively panel discussion covering topics around public health and the impact they've had on education and practice um, and where you can access um, resources for your collection development. We will have a Q&A at the end of the session and this um, we, we reserve some time at the end. Um, we do ask that um, because we have the audience muted that you use your toolbar and the question answer functionality and we will read through your questions and um, get to them at the end of the session. If by any chance we don't get to your question, we will respond um, via email after the um, session ends. We are recording this session, um, just so you know. We will have it posted on our YouTube page and make it available to our panelists for use and distribution. Okay, so I'm Nicole Gallo. I'm the Executive Director at Rittenhouse Book Distributors. I'm in my 26th year with Rittenhouse um, in sales and marketing um, capacities. I work with our library services departments as well as our um, technology teams. I graduated from Miami University a long time ago um, with the BA in speech communications, which um, I'm happy to say I get to do things like this and I get to put that to use. So um, certainly I think I've, I've been around for a while. Feel free to email me. We'll have our contact information at the end of the slides. Um, I'm going to go ahead and get to our panel. Um, our first panelist is Dr. Chandra Ford. She is a professor at the Demar Department of Community Health Sciences at UCLA and the founding director of the Center for Study of Racism, Social Justice, and Health. So welcome, um, Dr. Ford. I'll give you just a moment to um, continue that introduction. Uh, good morning or good afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And um, I would just add that um, as the founding center director for the study of Ra Center for the Study of Racism, Social Justice and Health, we considered it a real privilege to be able to lead in editing the book Racism, Science and Tools for the Public Health Professional um, for APHA Press. So thank Wonderful. you. Wonderful. And thank you for giving us your time today. We appreciate it. And you're right, it is still before noon out on the West Coast. So um, we probably have a good combination of um, people on the West Coast as well as the East Coast. Um, I just wanna give a special shout out. We have Rich Lampert joining us today. Um, he has now retired from the business, but I would uh, be remiss if I didn't let everyone know he's joined us on the line. Um, he was in medical publishing for more than 48 years. Um, he served as uh, consulting acquisitions editor for APHA and was involved in recruiting the editorial team for the book we'll be discussing today. Um, so I wanted to give him a shout out. Um, and also during retirement, he wrote Medical Publishing in Philadelphia, an informal history. And it's really a fascinating read. Um, we have it available through Rittenhouse as well as Amazon and some other places. So we're happy to have Rich on the line. Um, certainly if you have any specific questions for him, I'm sure he'd be happy to jump in. Um, so thanks for joining us, Rich. You're welcome. Okay, no problem. Um, David Hartogs is joining us. He's the marketing manager with APH Press. And David, I'll give you an opportunity to um, give a little bit of your bio. Sure, hi. Um, my name is David Hartogs. Um, I've been with APHA Press for, uh, I think, 12 or 13 years now. Uh, I have the numbers in the elude me. And I've been in uh, solid <laughs> publishing for about 18 years uh, with American Geophysical Union prior to that. I uh, graduated from Ohio University uh, some time ago, uh, and I uh, really loved working in public health at, for American Public Health Association. Uh, it's been a wild couple of years, which we'll get into later, and uh, I'm looking forward to this discussion. Great, thank you, David. And of course, we have Dan Duty joining today. He is the president and CEO of Duty Enterprises. So Dan, thank you for joining us. Um, he's not new to some of our roots. Um, we've had him with us in the past. 
Yeah, so um, hello everyone. Thank you again to Nicole and Laura for this invitation. Uh, we're delighted to be on this panel. Uh, I've been in the health sciences publishing business since uh, 1977. I started my own comp my own medical book review company back in <clears throat> 1993, 28 years ago. Um, and so I'm here really to talk about the public health literature and APHA Press's place in it. Thank you, Nicole. You're welcome. Okay, so we're just going to spend really two minutes talking about some really high level trends. Um, I think it's no secret in today's environment and with everything going on in the world, it's you've got to stay connected um, to stay up to date on what's going on. Um, and it is a great time um, to be in this learning environment because there is so much information readily available. Um, for anyone who isn't aware, um, what public health is defined as, it's the science and art of preventing disease, prolonging and promoting health through organized efforts um, with society, organizations, public and private communities and individuals. So it's a pretty broad definition, um, but just in case um, we have any newbies online, I uh, wanted to give that high level definition. Um, a lot going on, as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, I went out and, and searched around for some information. And of course, this comes from the directly from the APHA. Um, but, you know, even in the U.S. where you live, your income, your education, your race, your access to health care um, can really make a difference as much as a 15 year difference in how long you live. Um, and studies show that even wealthy, high educated Americans with access to quality care suffer disadvantages to peers in other, other high income countries. So it really is a, um, a, a public health issue right now in America. And we're going to be talking about some of the impacts and what's going on with that in today's world. Um, I had the privilege of attending the um, Healthcare Information and Management Systems and Society meeting in August. Um, it was my first <laughs> step back into um, a face-to-face -face meeting environment, um, but I have to say most of the sessions touched on public health in one way or another. And there was a lot of discussion, um, and I, I pulled some of the, the big overarching trends that were discussed, and I thought I would just bring them up here, something to be aware of as you're looking at your collection development for public health. Um, there's a lot going on right now with value-based care, or v, you know BBC. If you're not familiar with it, um, it's the idea of improving quality and outcomes for patients. Reaching this goal is based on a set of changes in the ways that um, your patients receive care. So there really has to be change in order for value-based care to be successful. Um, it really is a proactive approach and it, it's taking um, and looking at problems and preventing them before they start. So that value-based care is really a hot topic right now. Um, a lot on the science of digital medicine and, and here we are on a webinar um, talking about public health. Um, and there are many of us on the line, and that's exactly what is happening with the science of digital medicine. It's moving from one to one to one to many. So um, there's a lot of different initiatives within healthcare right now to address this, um, decentralizing clinical trials, and um, really improving the access to information. So making information more readily available and uh, making it um, accessible uh, so that we can learn from each other no matter where we are or who we are um, around the world. So it really is um, moving to this one-to-many type of environment. Um, telemedicine, we recently did another um, online course all about telemedicine, so you can find it um, on our YouTube channel. But there's so much going on, and, and COVID-19 really impacted this. Um, but medicine is moving to a self-service type of environment, and that really will help with being proactive um, and value-based care. But um, patients are used to being consumers, so they like that consumer experience, and healthcare is coming to realize that. So um, it really is the consumer to patient continuum. So giving them the same experience they get in Netflix um, with their medical care. Um, one thing that was discussed is that you need buy-in across the institution, whether it's in education or healthcare. 
um, you know, there's a lot of worry and discussion about so social isolation. Um, so that's something to be cognizant of. And, um, you know, telemedicine was really low, uh, had a low adoption rate prior to COVID. And then we saw that explosion because the need drove, um, drove the availability and the access to uh, virtual medicine. So we see that, um, you know, often um, in healthcare. Um, a little bit on customer-centric care, the patient experience is everything. Um, price, transparency, and equity has really um, taken the forefront in some of these discussions. And I think we'll continue to see um, how customer-centric care, telemedicine, digital medicine, um, they all kind of work together. Um, and value-based care is right in there with putting that customer first. So um, a lot of high-level discussion about that as well. So all of these things um, can be discussed as they relate to climate change, of course, COVID-19, environmental health, gun violence, health equity, racism and health, um, and of course, vaccines right now. So, you know, keep these topics on your radar. Um, being in health science is publishing. One of the things that we see um, happening is that the publishers are creating collections in all of these areas as they relate to healthcare, um, and we, we continue to curate collections as you do in your libraries, and we see it across the board in health sciences publishing. So we're going to talk a little bit more about that, um, but enough from me. Um, we should get to our panel right now and talk about um, some of the hot topics that um, we promised for this session. So the first question is going to go out to um, everyone on the panel, and um, we want to have a discussion about how all of these recent trends and what we're seeing in public health are impacting the resources that you produce. And I think, Dr. Ford, it might be good if we start with you, um, considering the book that you published back in 2019 and, and maybe talking a little bit about how what you see happening now is impacting what you're doing. Okay, thank you for the question. Um, mm -hmm. I will say that we were really surprised um, when we were first putting together this book, which was um, actually in the in 2018 before the pandemic and before many of the sort of poli uh, political elements um, mm -hmm. that shaped the pandemic and um, we thought at the time that what we needed to do was to hurry up and finish the book because um, although many of us had been doing work on racism and health for some time we didn't think there would be much interest in it um, over the long term um, so we have been surprised by the level of interest in uh, this, you know, the intersections of public health and racism. And certainly the pandemic has underscored the need to address these things. Mm -hmm. I would say that that trend is something that's continuing. Um, and so we're seeing a great demand to rely on this book and other resources, but this book in particular to guide public health professionals, but also others, um, organizations in general, local health departments, local governments, independently of the health department, and trying to address the ways that racism may be affecting the well being of, of their communities and, and workforces. Yeah, that, that, that's very true, very interesting. Well, thank you. What about you, David? What do you think? Um, well, so, so it's interesting, you know, it's been a wild two years in public health. Um, and, and the good thing for us is we, we've had a strategic plan, plan all along that with the help of Goody Consulting, uh, Rich and Dan, we came up with about eight years ago and we are constantly updating. So a lot of these trends you're seeing now have been in our strategic plan. Uh, so, so for example, the racism science and tools book, uh, you know, social and racial equity is a major, major part of public health, uh, as Nicole alluded to, you can pinpoint someone's life expectancy based on their zip code. Um, and, you know, public health, we're trying to eliminate that. So when we came up with the racism book, uh, the idea I think started way back in 2015. Um, and then, you know, it was finally executed in 2019. You know, we, we were really excited for the book. We never dreamed that what we would see happen in 2020, but the book has been a really, really um, popular book, uh, not only here, but we've seen some big sales uh, across our European sales channel as well. 
So um, not, not only is it a domestic issue, it's a global issue. Sure. And then with the other trends, we, you know, um, the opioid epidemic is gotten worse since the, uh, obviously, since the COVID pandemic. So, you know, we're trying to keep up and we're trying to find the right books and the right authors to do these books. Um, you know, as far as doing a book, everyone keeps asking if we're going to do a book on COVID, what we're doing, what we're, we are in the process of figuring out what we're going to do, who we're going to do it with and how we're going to do it. There's yeah. a lot of literature and a lot of stuff has been produced, but as soon as something's produced right now, it's almost out of date. So mm -hmm. we're trying to come up with what the, the book is going to be uh, going forward while also looking back a little bit. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. For sure. Um, Dan, how about um, you with Duties Enterprises? Yeah, so from my perch as, um, you know, <clears throat> reviewing all books that come in, um, the recent trends in public health have impacted uh, resources we produce in two ways. First, it's easier for us to find expert reviewers in public health titles recently, and it's due to the urgent nature of our current prevailing public health concerns, many of which have already been uh, um, uh, mentioned. And Duty Enterprise's newest product, which we introduced October 1st of 2020, is Duty's Special Topics Lists. And this is a quarterly list of books curated by specialist librarians, each on a different topic. So since March of 2020, when we came up with our very first list, um, we published six lists. And four of the six lists we've created have been related to public health. We did a list wow. on COVID-19, one on health equity, one on stress and healthcare professionals. And just uh, in tomorrow, we are publishing a list of curated books on vaccinations. Yeah, uh, it, it, it's pretty amazing, isn't it? How, how you know, four or five years ago, these lists might have been, you know, internal medicine and things like that. And now it, it, it really is, you know, everything is centering around public health. Thank you. Okay, so um, David, we have uh, a question for you. Um, how have these increasingly important topics influenced your publishing plan? And you touched on that a little bit. Um, and maybe you can touch on, you know, the effort to support, support education and practice with these trends in public health. Uh, sure. So, so I did touch on it a little bit. Um, you know, I, I think for us, since we have the strategic part, we know what we want to produce um, really hasn't changed. It's now a delivery method. You now we're, we're grappling with how can we deliver these effectively to um, not only public health departments, but also to universities in a timely fashion. You can't just mail a book anymore. You don't know if that person's working from home or if they're in their office or where they're going to be the next month. So oh. you know, de definitely trying to bolster our ePubs platforms and e-delivery platforms as well. Um, so these topics are, are really kind of stressing us in terms of trying to get as much quality information into the correct people's hands as possible, as quickly and efficiently as possible. So we, we've been working hard to um, kind of streamline our, our delivery methods. Are you um, thinking about, you know, the, the, the content first and then the output second at this point? So you know that you know whatever content you're developing it's going to have many different places to live or are you still thinking about things you know, you're going to publish and then make it available digitally i'm just curious yeah that, that's a good question so we, we are an older slower publisher so for the vast majority of our products we are thinking okay we'll put it in print and then later on it'll go digitally uh, but we do have products like our control of communicable diseases manual um, which is over 100 years old now and about to jump into to its 21st edition. Um, now, when it's updated, um, it's updated immediately online. So we're actually thinking about that first. Let's update the online version. And then when we have enough content ready, we'll hit print and have a new print edition. Uh, we're also yeah. developing a couple new series as well. Um, and we're, we're thinking, okay, these books, uh, they're going to be smaller books. Are they going to be digital only or not? So we're starting to shift a bit in terms of how we're delivering them. Um, and some of our books are on multiple multiple platforms. I know we use R2 a lot um, and we use a couple other aggregators. 
um, for us. So, you know, our goal is to get as get our information to as many people's hands as possible by whatever means we can. Yeah, and that makes a lot of sense. I mean, one thing that we recognized, um, you know, pretty quickly once the pandemic hit was this shift to, you know, by librarians and hospitals to be able to provide digital access to resources that they might have only had in print before. Um, and certainly it was a, a scramble at the time with everyone, um, you know, trying to make sure that their patrons could access that. So, you know, that's definitely good to hear. Okay. Um, Dan, um, you know, give, you know, from your background with public health trends, um, you know, maybe you can talk about the selection process um, as you look to develop those special topics lists, because it seems like there's a lot more publishing lately. Sure, so for the duty special topics lists, we have an editorial board of five health sciences librarians in the US and Canada, and they deliberate, deliberate over what topics will comprise the four lists for the coming year. Two of the four lists in 2021 were public health related, and two of the uh, 2022 lists will be as well. And in, in addition to vaccinations later on in 2022, we'll be publishing a special topics list on climate change. Okay, and are you seeing just more publications coming in in these areas, or you know, what are you seeing from the publishing side? Well, you know, uh, I, I did a, a quick search of our database uh, last um, about two months ago for books just on COVID-19 or coronavirus. I limited my search to those terms, and they had to be in the title. And there are already 200 titles in our database on COVID or coronavirus. So David already alluded to that, that there's a flood of literature out there long before we even, while we're in the middle of the pandemic and before we really understand the science of the prevention and control of a pandemic like coronavirus. So yes, um, there's a lot more uh, activity in these areas. I wouldn't necessarily say it's high quality. Um, and so, you know, one of our, our basic mission and mantra is to focus, to look at all of these books and, and, and try to separate the wheat from the chaff and, and make the librarians' uh, decisions easier on which titles they, sh they should be most interested in. Yeah, and I, um, it's interesting because I definitely, you know, at Rittenhouse, when COVID first hit, you know, we were putting together infectious disease, you know, collections. And very quickly after that, you know, we had a pretty robust collection of, you know, titles that had COVID-19 in them. So I, I definitely see that. Dr. Ford, I apologize. I skipped right past your question. So <laughs> I go, I'm going to go to you next um, about your book, Racism, Science and Tools for Public Health Professional. It was published in 2019. Um, we talked a little bit about this in the intro question, but Maybe you can talk about how the times have changed and you know what the catalyst was at the time for this book versus what it is now. Mm -hmm. So I really came on to this project um, invited after a fair amount of thinking about this as, a, as has already been mentioned, have been put into place in terms of where APHA really wanted to go in um, being a leader in the field of public health and addressing racism as a public health issue. And again, we were really thinking people are not going to be interested in this topic over the long haul. So let's hurry up and put our important work out there very quickly so that, that folks can do it. And our approach at the time really tried to balance a mix of very senior people and newer people into the field, but really with an eye towards not uh, gathering a collection of who's who in the academic world, but uh, folks who are doing work who would be able to um, put that work forward in ways that would be actionable for the public health professional on the front line of the field. Uh, in terms of, we are actually thinking about what would a next edition look like? Yeah. Um, and some of the things that come to mind as considerations to balance are, the immediate, the immediacy, the relevance um, of the current moment and, and many of the dynamics within the field and outside the field versus 
having the book have a staying power and, and relevance over the long term. Uh, the diversity of perspectives, I think we would revisit uh, mm -hmm. the, the diversity of perspectives in the book, given the moment that we're in now and, and seek to expand that, maybe shift that um, in terms of perspectives, contributors, and topics. So in terms of the book, those are some, I would say probably two big things that we're thinking about now that might shift um, moving forward, and not in, in a negative way shift, but just you know things that need to be considered as we think about this type of project moving forward. So I, it, I would think that, you know, in everything that you do, you're thinking about that. And as we all are now more, um, given the, the state of everything going on um, with, you know, expanding perspectives, how, I'm just curious, how would you go about doing that? So in our ongoing work with, um, with uh, my COVID task force on racism and equity, um, we've been trying to think about how do we disseminate quickly and part of that is thinking about partnerships. And so I keep thinking about, for instance, libraries and librarians as potential partners for um, the dissemination of information. We also have to think about what it means to disseminate information rapidly with community, which is something we have been doing to a certain extent, while at the same time not producing a two-tiered system where information shared with community is not peer reviewed, but information that's published in uh, trade journals or um, in books that are targeting the profession are peer reviewed. Um, mm -hmm. And so for us, one of the really big things is um, the to, to share the information quickly. And then also we're in this moment now where people, many people in the public don't just want to receive the information, they wanna play some role in informing what the work is that's being done yeah. in many cases so um how do we also account for that yeah that's really i mean a huge challenge but really interesting to think about okay i just i know we are um you know we have a few more minutes left if anyone has any questions um if you would um put them into the question bar we'll have a few minutes um here at the end um i know we have a few questions coming in um, I just want to mention, um, you know, we're talking about, you know, racism, science and tools for the public health professional. Um, that title, as I mentioned, is available through APHA Press. Um, it is on duty's special topics list, and it's part of duty's core title, special collection. Um, there is a handout attached to this webinar that you can grab that um, and take a look at that list. Um, the book is available, obviously, with Rittenhouse and on the r2digitallibrary.com. Um, it is part of our special collection there as well. So um, there are a lot of different places to go and get information um, as you're thinking about your collection development and how you might um, broaden your um, public health offerings um, in some of these specific areas. Um, let me go and see. Um, duties, enterprises, resources are available through Duties Enterprises. Um, I put the link there. Um, we at Rittenhouse do work with Duties core titles and Duties special topics lists. So we make them available through Rittenhouse and they're right on the left nav. When you log in to R2 or on Rittenhouse.com, um, we make the print and the digital um, collections available. So you will find um, Dr. Ford's book there as well. Um, Q&A, if you have any questions, um, you can go ahead and throw them into the Q&A um, question and answer bar, and we will get to them. Um, I do want to say that we will have, someone asked about the recording, the recording will be available on the Rittenhouse YouTube page. Anyone who attends the webinar will get a follow-up email um, and uh, be able to hit that link to um, go out and access that webinar, and we will be sharing it with APHA and um, duty enterprises um, so i do have a question here um, dr ford this one is for you um, and it is around um, getting information into the community and you know you mentioned you know making sure that that's peer-reviewed as well as um, you know the information going into an academic setting what do you think are some of the best ways to get that information out to the community 
Um, one thing that we're exploring is a possibility of uh, having a rapid publication. Um, there are many different formats for it, but a rapid publication journal series. So one that undergoes a peer review process in a faster process than usual. That part is in a scientific journal. Um, the other strategies that we've been using are, are pretty common. For instance, town halls and those kinds of things. But those are certainly not, um, they do not undergo the peer review process in the same kind of way. Right. And if you, when you think about it from the community seeking information, and this is my question to you, you know, where do you think just a, a general person out in the community would go to find information? Do they, do you feel that, you know, each community, I know you mentioned that, you know, there's been a lot of interest in your work um, within the community. Do you have any insight to that? Like where just the general person would go? Do you think they'd go to their library? So this is actually a concern that I have based on what I and many of my colleagues have been observing. There has been a flood of, um, I'll call it stuff, in this recent period mm -hmm. on racism and COVID, and not so much in terms of quality control. And so I think that the short of it is that people go to places like social media. Um, the work we're doing suggests that you know, health departments, for instance, are not really playing a good role, that they could play a good role on places like social media and helping to shape um, or maybe help people understand what's good quality, what's not good quality. Um, I, I haven't seen a full resolution to it yet myself. I can't say that I've spent, you know, a whole lot of time systematically assessing it. And maybe this is something that Dan or Dave, David could speak to. Dan or David, do you have any insight there? Um, we, we don't have any insight, but it is on our mind, you know, um, communicating public health effectively um, has always been a challenge for public health and it's never been more evident than the past 18 months or so. So I, I think, you know, that, that's, a, that's one of the challenges we're facing, uh, not just in the publishing world, but in the public health world as a whole. Um, so hopefully, uh, we, you know, we get, we get our heads together and, and figure, figure it out and there'll probably be baby steps before we conquer the whole communicating public health effectively. Um, but it is a big challenge right now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it, it, you know, we, I mean, we even see it in the hospital systems where they have to go to so many disparate places to find information from all different sources. Um, so, you know, we at Rittenhouse are also giving that a lot of thought as we think about um, you know, our new digital offerings. So, and, you know, we've always kind of been the Switzerland of vetted information, um, you know, working with that peer reviewed information, but, you know, taking it a next step would be um, something interesting to think about. Well, we are definitely over time. So I, I want to thank our panel, um, everyone for joining us today. This was really informative. I really enjoyed the discussion. Um, hopefully we'll be able to continue it um, in the near future. And certainly anyone on the webinar, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. And we thank you all for joining us today. Have a great day.